You're the king and you are invited to come in. Come in, Lord, and speak to us right now like no man has ever done. That somebody today may come and say, what must I do to be saved? Speak to someone hard, oh God, that has never drove closer to you. But today, they will always follow you. And they will keep your commandments in the faith of Jesus. Forgive us for all our sins. Bless us in a very special way, oh God. Send your angels to anoint us that we will come in here with a sweet refreshing and always keep our minds stayed on you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me, let me, let me ask you to do me a favor. I need everyone to just stand to your feet and then you can sit back down. But I need everyone to stand to your feet and make some noise for the Almighty right now. God is a jealous God, and he wants to hear noise. He doesn't want to hear a strange noise, but he wants to hear a holy noise. Do I have a holy noise worshipers in this place today? Make a sound unto him. Lift your voice and give him a worship, a praise. Hallelujah. I need somebody to know that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord for surely the Lord is in this place. Surely the Lord is in this place. Surely the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, we're about to praise him right now. You can, you may have your seat if you can, if you want to. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, put your hands together. Oh.
somebody to go with me and help me lift him up. Right here, right here. Oh, help me lift him up. Help me lift him up. Said I want to know, I want to know. jealous God you don't want any gods before you God's meaning anything that keeps us bound drugs alcohol those friends that are enemies don't want you to worship him. God is jealous. I created you in my likeness. Therefore, worship me. Come on, worship him. Look towards heaven. Look towards heaven. talk to him all week and that is not the schedule thank you Jesus the song simply says he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I'm like a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy yes Lord when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are towards me and Lord how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all.
for me. Love like a hairy king, I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercies. Yes, Lord. Oh. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions and cleanses. that he loves us today anybody glad that God loves us even when we're not loving to him and the thing that I'm realizing about real love is real love forgives come on and hear somebody we've all had that one person who has done something that has hurt us anybody ever been hurt in here before and you realize that when you love somebody that even when they hurt you, you want to repair the relationship. 
Okay, I know you don't want to hear that, but let's, let's tell the truth in here. Somebody's been hurt in here before. And because you love the person who has hurt you, you want to repair the relationship. How about this? Some of us in here have hurt somebody else. Whether or not you chose to do it intentionally or by accident, but because you loved them, you wanted the relationship restored. Because we're human, forgiveness is a part of relationships. Watch this. When God comes to us, when God introduces himself to us, God lets us know that he is love. Yes, he's holy. Isn't he holy? Yes, he's powerful. Isn't he powerful? But when God describes himself, he takes one term and says, I am love. And love forgives. There is somebody in here today who is feeling like what you did last week is the last straw for your relationship with God. I want to let you know that God forgives. You believing that what you did last night would, would actually warrant you being cut off and you are afraid to open up your eyes and worship because of your shame. I want to let you know that God forgives. And because you are his child, because you are his daughter, because you are his son, even before you ask for it, you are forgiven. Somebody needs some help believing that today. Would you stand with me? I need to believe that I am forgiven. I want to be forgiven. I need God to wave the wand over me and to help me feel forgiven. I need God to continue forgiving me for what I'm thinking right now. Anybody need to be washed clean right now? I want God to forgive me. I want him to make me new. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you love us. Even when we have not loved ourselves, God, you have loved us and we want to say thank you because we know we don't deserve it. God, we believe your word when you say that when we confess our sins, God, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here we are, God, and we feel forgiven, but now we need you to do some washing, God. Would you wash out our minds? Would you wash out our mouths? Would you wash out our characters and make us new oh God make us into the creature that you have created us to be Lord we have come from all over this conference and many of us need not only forgiveness we need provision oh God we need you to go and do for us back at home what we are praying for many of us need health God we need to be healed many of us need our relationships to be restored we're praying that you would work on our behalf oh God we're asking you, Lord, that you would bless our children as we have gathered them here, oh God. We as parents and chaperones are praying that something would happen in this room that is so powerful that one child that is teetering between life and death would choose you, oh God. Would you move so mightily in this place? Would you move so powerfully in this place that the one who is playing on the phone, that the one who is totally disconnected it would receive a spark from heaven speak to our hearts oh God we're praying over the preachers Lord we're asking
asking that the fire of your anointing would ignite them, oh God, like never before. Would you put words in their mouth, oh God? Would you put concepts in their mind that would blow them away, oh God, so that your people would be led to your throne? And we're praying that at the end of it, it would not just be a record-breaking forgiven conference, that it wouldn't be a great youth congress. We're praying that we would be drawn to your throne, oh God. We're praying that we would be better soldiers before you, oh Lord. We ask that we would be saved today. Won't you do it, oh God, according to your promise? And when it's all said and done, we will not fail to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Because you alone are worthy. And we're believing it now by putting together our hands. God, we believe it. We receive your word. We give it all to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. He wants to hear.
Amen. Anybody enjoy that choir? <laughs> I tell you, I praise God for just a little dream that was in my head. And the Lord has taken this dream and look at what these kids are doing. I think we ought to give Jesus Crave. Come on, you can put your hands together for Jesus Crave one more time. Amen. We, are, we praise God for them. Um, this is an amazing choir. I think we're the only one that has a conference-wide youth choir. Come on, say amen. Amen. I understand they're going to be singing for us at United Youth Congress. And I don't know how they got that gig. They evidently know the president for beta. Come on, say amen. Just slid it right on in. Um, today, we're going to lift our offering today. Uh, you heard about the uh, challenge that we're having. And um, we saw many young people in the prisons. And, you know, it breaks your heart to see so many young people in there. But we are very happy and blessed to see so many young people in the house of God today. And so we just want to remind you that no matter what you're going through, you can still trust God. The sea is troubled, and the night has been so long. Out on the open water, I'm praying for the dark. But I don't have to worry.
is a challenge to, to get people who have been given great responsibilities to serve the Lord around uh, North America. And not only to just get one or two, but to get three to sync their calendars in such a way that they can all be here in South Central Conference for our Forgiven Many Congress. Um, for all three of them, the time was not on their schedule, but um, when you owe people, sometimes you have to pay them even when it's inconvenient. Come on, say amen. And so all three of the preachers owe this young man their life. <laughs> but this is the best I can get by getting them to come and hang out with us. Uh, you all know them. It doesn't, we won't take a long time to introduce them. We just want to say thank you to Pastor Deblier Snell, Senior Pastor of the First Seventh-day Adventist Church, Huntsville, Alabama. We just want to say thank you to Pastor Michael V. Kelly, Senior Pastor of Mount Rubido, Riverside, California. We want to say thank you to Dr. Myron Edmonds, Senior Pastor of the Glenville Seventh-day Adventist Church, Cleveland, Ohio. All three of them making a sacrifice the first month of the year to be away from their churches, um, but to come and be with us. Honestly, it wasn't because of me. It was because of the young people in South Central Conference. They love them. They committed to coming. We're thankful. Let's put our hands together and thank them one more time for coming to be with us. We just know God is going to move. And at this point, we don't really care how. Come on, say amen. We just want him to move. After the choir, Jesus' grave shall have sung. We shall hear from God's men for this day. God bless you.
we just take a moment and put our hands together for Jesus Christ one more time? And let's just give him the praise and the glory, the honor that he's worthy of. If God has been good to you, won't you say amen? If he's been real good, won't you shout hallelujah? If he's an on-time God, won't you say thank you, Jesus? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, I'm just so thankful today for this opportunity uh, to worship the true and living God in spirit and in truth. Um, I do just want to take really quick about uh, three of my 17 moments and just uh, give a few acknowledgments. Can we just take a moment to just give God praise for our youth choir one more time this morning? Can we just put our hands together and affirm the work that they do? Now we can do better than that. Let's affirm the work of these young people. Man, if they, was, if they was auditioning for American Idol, Twitter would just break down with criticisms and critiques. But God has set aside some of his own. And so for that, we give thanks today. And uh, secondly, I just think it is appropriate at this time that we, the family of South Central, take some time to just show our appreciation for the excellence in youth ministry that we've been under for the last 10 years. I want to invite Pastor Griffin, Pastor Hewlett to stand. And I want to invite us to stand and let's just put our hands together and just affirm these mighty warriors of God, these warriors for the spirit. Preachers, we love you. We appreciate you. We'll follow you wherever you lead us. And we thank God for the opportunity to just to be able to work with you for a little bit these last few years, these last few years. And again, we thank God for you and your wives, your tremendous sacrifice, and how God has used you so mightily over the years. And, and we're grateful for that. Um, today, uh, today, the message, there's going to be one sermon preached in three different parts. Can you say amen? And so today, we're not going to belabor you with much preamble. We want to go right on into the Word. Let's go with me in our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 15. All of us will kind of come from this same story, just three different components of it. Luke chapter 15, and um, let us begin together at verse number 11, very familiar story. Luke chapter 15, and we will begin together at verse number 11. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Luke chapter 15, and we'll look together at verse number 11, and we'll invite you to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord today. Luke chapter 15, and we'll get together right here around verse number 11. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Luke chapter 15, excuse me, and verse 11. The Bible says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. How many sons? And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of thy substance that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all there, he, there arose a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And the word says, and no man gave him anything. No man gave him anything anything. Then the Bible says in verse 17 that when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare and I perish with hunger? He says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet afar off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. Today, saints, for a little while, all three of us want to preach under the subject, there's no place like home. 
no place like home. Let us pray together. Father, I pray that in this little while you would say much. I pray, Father, that you would hide us in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and that Jesus would receive exclusive praise. So, Lord, bless us, add strength to our weakness is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, let them that believe say together, amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord today. It's interesting. Um, I spent some time this week just kind of looking back at my days uh, at Oakwood. And um, I have to admit that looking back on my time as a young theological student at Oakwood, I can admit that we did some things back then that I can only describe as being juvenile in nature. You see, I remember being an upperclassman at Edwards Hall, and what we would do is we would kind of sneak out some nights in after curfew, and we would engage in this battle with the dudes from Peterson Hall, and what we would call this is a rumble. And so we would sneak out after curfew, and we would meet over by the library, and we would just engage in a testosterone festival. And it's crazy, when you would see this thing, it was the ultimate exercise in machismo. Dudes would be outside fist pumping and pounding their chest. Some would be shirtless with bandanas on their heads and, and security tried to crack down on it because even though for the most part it was good natured with boys, things would always tend to go a little too far. And so there would be times where because we were so pumped up, some would leave with fractures and lacerations and scars all over their body. And so I remember one night we were out there just giving it to these dudes from Peterson Hall and all of a sudden security showed up and when security showed up, I mean, we scattered like roaches when the lights come on in the room and, and everybody just went back to their dorm room. And so I remember hurrying back to Edwards Hall and running up the stairwell to my room. And just before I went around the last corner, when I went around that last edge, I ran into the night dean for my wing. And it's crazy because once he cornered me, I mean, rightly, he just began to just lay into me. He began to say, aren't you supposed to be a leader, but you're acting like a follower. He would say, aren't you supposed to be studying for the ministry and I was like yes I am and with all the conviction he could muster up he just said to me if this is what the future of the church is going to look like I feel sorry for the church in the future and, and it's crazy because man the rebuke and chastening was rightly deserved at the time I understood and accepted what he was saying to me then but the funny thing saints is that even when I see him at alumni's and camp meetings 20 years later the crazy thing is that when he see me, he still just kind of shakes his head with discouragement and consternation. Like, I can't believe South Central let this dude be over a church. Uh, um, and the funny thing that his interactions with me show me is that people have a way of labeling you permanently based upon where you are presently. Uh, uh, see, you, you got to understand that people are like web browsers. They always remember your history. Are y'all with me today? And see, one of the things you got to know is that for some people they will permanently define you by the weakest moment in your life so for some you'll always just be the girl that got pregnant to others you'll always be the dude that got high for some you'll always be the one that got kicked out of school but do I have any thankful saints that God is not like man is there anybody that's just thankful that we serve a forgetful God in this room can somebody just give him a praise that he does not hold grudges that he has taken a decision to take our sins, hide them into the depths of the sea, and remember them no more. Can you say amen? And see, the difference between God and people is that people see snapshots where God looks at motion pictures. And see, the thing I love about God is that people can only measure life from the present forward, but God looks at the world from the future backwards. So God does not see you as what you are. He only sees you as what you shall become. Oh, y'all not with me in this room today? Uh, uh, let, let me say it this way. I remember uh, a couple years back, man, growing up in Tallahassee, I am a diehard Florida State Seminole football fan. And, and so I remember there was one Saturday night, I was watching a game in Huntsville, and I was talking to my dad and brothers as they were watching a game down in Florida. And so we were commenting on the game because our team was losing.
losing uh, at the point in this conversation. And so because my kids were acting up, uh, I had to take my DVR. And when you have a DVR, you can pause live television. And so what happened is I went to tend to the kids for about 15 minutes. And so I went back and turned on the game. And as I am watching the game, we're still down by a touchdown or two. But the crazy thing is I hear my dad and brother shouting and rejoicing on the other end. And the reason I can't understand their rejoicing is because our team has took the lead. And the reason I can't shout with them is because they're looking at the game presently while I'm still watching old outdated footage. Y'all not with me in this room today. You see, the reason my night dean can't shout with me now is because he's still looking at old footage. Is there anybody in this room today that is just thankful that God is moving in the present and he's buried your sins in the past and the reason some folk can't understand your praise the reason they don't understand why you shout is because they're still looking at old footage they can't see where God has you right now but do I have a witness today that you might not be all that you ought to be but praise God we're better than we used to be and with the Holy Ghost we're getting better all the time can the church say amen Oh, man. And so this is an interesting story about this prodigal young man who leaves his father's house. Now, real quick, I'm going to take my seat. There are just three things that I want to say about this young man. The first problem with this young man is that he can't quite understand the hugeness of the father's plans for him. Now, understand that this young guy strolls into his daddy's house and essentially demands for the father to give him the portion of the goods that belongs to him. Now, the thing you got to understand is that this this boy does not come in and ask for a loan. What he asks for is the portion of the inheritance that had been set aside by his father on his own behalf. And isn't it interesting that he strolls into the father's living room. The dad is in the lazy boy recliner chair, the big boy seat in the living room, and he comes in and it's interesting that he wants the father's presence, but he doesn't want the father's presence. Oh, y'all didn't get that today. He, he wants the father's presence, but he doesn't and want the father's presence. In other words, he wants what the father can give, but he doesn't really have any room for the father in his life. Uh, he wants what the father can give, but he has no desire to be with the father himself. And this, this boy's interaction with the father is transactional in nature. He's in with the father just to see what he can get. And the boy's interaction with the dad reflects our interactions with God. Come on and say amen. You see, the fact is that some of us only call on God when we need something. You might as well say amen in this room. The bottom line is today that some of us are not in a covenant. Some of us are not in a relationship. For some of us, God is just our friend with benefits. Oh, y'all y'all not with me in this room today. In other words, for some, we've just made God our side piece, our parachute, our backup plan, who we go to when what we really want doesn't come through as we want. Come on and say amen. And, and the interesting thing about this is that this, this young guy comes in and says, listen, I want my inheritance. That's not a problem. But the problem is, he says, I want my inheritance right now. Now, the interesting thing is how bad this decision is. Because rabbinical law actually kind of determined based upon where you live. Once you got your portion of the inheritance, while your father or parents were still alive, you could not get everything they had set aside. The law said you could only get about half of what they actually actually had in store for you. And so once you got the inheritance, once your father was still alive, it was actually considered a cursed inheritance that could not prosper because you claimed what the father wanted to give you before it was time. Uh, let, let me just say it this way. There are certain blessings, young people, that God wants to give you, but it'll be a curse to you if you get it before it's time. Uh, let me just say it this way, that young adults, marriage is a good thing, but it's a curse if you do it before it's his time. Time. Uh, sex is a powerful thing, but it curses you if you do it before it's his time. Understand being on your own is a good thing, but it curses you if you do it before it's his time. I'm a witness that having children is a blessing, but man, it burns if you get them before it's his time. Y'all not be in this room today. Uh, uh, and it's an interesting thing that he makes a decision to say, man, I'm going to leave less than half of what the father has planned for me just so I can have have it right now. In other words, he leaves half of his father's intended blessings just so that he can fulfill the need of the moment. 
and how many of us miss out on over half of what God has in store for us because we are so dead set on having what we want right now. And see, the reason some of us are not as happy as God would intend is because we had to have it now, so we only got 50%. See, some of y'all got a boyfriend, but your man ain't but 50% of a man. That's why some of you ain't got but half a car and half a house and half your joy and half a right mind because you had to get it before it was his time. Oh, y'all not with me in this room today. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just say it this way real quick. I remember uh, over the Christmas holiday, uh, we took my son and my kids down to Orlando for the Christmas break. And, and so we spent the week down there. Now, my wife and I had predetermined before time that once we got down to Orlando, we were going to take the kids to Disney World. Now, the thing that we did not do is we did not tell them we were going to take them to Disney because, you know, when you tell your kids stuff like that beforehand, they'll drive you crazy the whole trip down. And, and so what we decided to do is we had the tickets. Everything was already ready to go. And so that morning, we were getting ready to go. We still didn't tell them. All we told them was that we're taking them somewhere fun. And so my oldest son, who is five, got really interested and curious about where it was that we're going to go. And so he said, Daddy, are we going to go play miniature golf again? I said, no, son. We're going somewhere better than that. And he says, well, Daddy, are, are we going to Red Robin? I said, no, son. Uh, we're, we're going somewhere better than that. He says, Daddy, are we going to Chuck E. Cheese? I said, no, son. We're going somewhere better than that. And so he looked at me and said, Daddy, are we going to heaven? <laughs> I said, son, you, you got to kind of split the difference just a, a little bit. And, and, and so I said, no, we're not going to heaven. At least not today. We are not. And, and so once he realized we were not going to Chuck E. Cheese, all of a sudden his attitude began to sour. His countenance began to change because up until this point, Chuck E. Cheese was like the zenith of all childlike experiences in his mind. Can't nothing get better than Chuck E. Cheese. But how many of us know that once we got on the inside of the magic kingdom, his head already began to explode and what he came to know is that his daddy was planning stuff for him that he could not even see and what his daddy had planned was better than what he wanted oh y'all not with me in this room oh how many of us know that God has some plans for you that are bigger than what you can see that are better than what you know can I say to some young sister you running around here talking to Chucky and God wants to give you Mickey Mouse Listen, man, you fooling with Chucky. Chucky got a house, but Mickey got a kingdom. Hey. See, man, you need to get the whole 50 cent. Come on and say amen. You need to get more than half. You want to get all that God has in store for you. Listen, don't get no dude no play because he's looking like 50 cent. Tell him if you're going to get with me, you got to be a whole dollar bill. Y'all ain't with me in this <laughs> hey, so, 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 listen, listen. The other thing about this boy's story, the second problem that this boy has is that he confuses protection with restriction. Now, this story is interesting because the love of the father is not actually just shown at the end. The love of the father is shown throughout this story. And isn't it interesting to note that once the boy comes in and says, listen, give me a portion of that which belongs to me. Did you notice that the father does not try to convince him to stay? He does not try to coerce him to remain. The father just breaks him off and lets him go. And see, the problem is we only see the father's love and that he let him come back home. But how many of us know that sometimes the best love is the tough love of knowing they're going to mess up and you let them make their own choices anyhow. Oh, uh, let me just pause and say to some of these folk with grown rebellious kids that won't listen to rise counsel, sometimes instead of covering up all their mistakes and taking the sting out of all of their consequences, sometimes you need to let them go out on their own and taste the bitterness of the betrayal of life because there are certain things that we won't learn from instruction, but we'll learn it from experience. Come on and say amen. How many of us understand that when you have to learn from experience, experience has a way of leaving some scars on your behind that lets you know not to come back this way anymore. And I want to say to my young people who always believe, I just got to learn it for myself. I just got to feel it for myself.
It's better to learn from instruction than from experience. Come on and say amen. It's better to learn from the instruction of those that have gone before you. It's better to learn from the experiences of those that have already gone on your behalf. You don't always have to learn the hard way. And I, we had gone down to our camp meeting for like 11 days and I remember we made the mistake of leaving a big bowl of fruit out on the table back home. And when we came back home after 11 days, we just had an infestation of fruit flies all over the house. And how many of us know you can't kill fruit flies clapping them or smashing them one at a time? You got to have to set some traps in order to get them uh, knocked down. And, and so what my wife did was she found a little Porsche uh, formula online where she filled a cup halfway up with vinegar and then she put some dishwashing liquid on the top, ran some water in it and let it bubble up. And so what happened is once all the fruit flies smelt the vinegar, they would come in search of the vinegar and get trapped down in the bubbles. And so for a whole week, man, all of these fruit flies are just getting knocked down. I would literally go to the counter just to see them get caught up in the snare every day. And it was funny because we got down to like those last two in the house that we could not kill. And so one day I'm looking there on the edge of the corner and it's funny how like one of the fruit flies came and landed right there on the edge of the cup. I can tell he wanted that vinegar. He was going to get ready to go down. But just before he went down, it's like he looked over and saw all his cousins. He saw Pookie and Tay Tay and LaShawn and Sharika and Deontay and he saw Pee Wee. He saw all his cousins down inside and just decided, I ain't going back down that way anymore. And, and what I just need you to know, young people, if you've seen all your girl cousins get pregnant before 18, if you've seen all of the men in your family wind up in jail, if you've seen what happens through drug abuse and alcoholism, don't you go down that road the same way. Choose a different path. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? And it's funny because all this dude wanted, and listen, I identify with him. All the dude wanted, all he wanted was just a little freedom. He just wanted a little bit more latitude to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. He just kind of had that natural maturity and instinct to kind of want to have this autonomy and independence of the house. And see, and this is where a lot of our young people are. Hear me real quick. Because see, like we have this kind of innate idea that Seventh Day Adventist lifestyle is some type of restriction that's been put in place to keep you from being able to enjoy to the fullest what God has in store for you. But see, one of the things that we tend to do is sometimes we mistake protection with restriction. See, you're not gonna really get this. You're gonna shout on this in like 20 years, but you're gonna realize the most free you'll ever be in your life is right now. See, see, this is the issue. See, God is an advocate of your freedom. See, when you serve God, you have the power of choice. But see, when you enter a covenant with the devil, he takes away the power of choice. See, you can decide, I'm going to leave God. I'm going to leave the church. And when you leave the church, all you've got to fight against are your convictions. But when you try to leave the devil, you got to fight against addiction. Mm. See, see, I said something right there. This is what I need you to know. See, you are so upset because you feel like you can't do certain things. But I need you to understand that choosing not to date is freedom. But feeling like you have to have a man, that's bondage. Choosing not to drink is freedom. But feeling like you have to drink is bondage. Choosing not to smoke weed is freedom. But feeling like you got to have it is bondage. Choosing not to wear jewelry is freedom. But feeling like you have to have it on to look good, that's bondage. Feeling like you kind of have to, so you're choosing not to watch porn is freedom. But when you have to watch it just to fall asleep, that's bondage. And see, the enemy has a way of pulling us in so deep that he makes freedom look like bondage. And he makes bondage look like freedom. But I need you, young person, that you, if you can find somebody that's going to be real with you, you need to ask the cocaine addict and they'll tell you how when they decided to walk away, how the powdery demons of cocaine begin to howl in their souls whenever they decided to walk away. Go ahead and ask the promiscuous brother how his body burns with passion in the late night hour when he tries to keep his thoughts centered on Christ. Go ahead and ask the alcoholic and they'll tell you how their palms begin to tremble and how their hands begin to sweat when there's no alcohol inside of the system. 
them. Go ahead and ask the homosexual brother and he'll tell you how he got into something through experimentation that's become a snare to him and he wishes to God he had never gone down that path. I need you to know that there's some things that look fun on the outside that look like it's going to bring more freedom and joy but it's a setup for the devil to snatch all of the peace and joy out of your life. Are y'all hearing me today? Listen, beloved, so now I can see my man. I can see my man. He is out on his own. He's got like a pocket full of ones. He's got him on his Sean John jeans. I can see him with his Air Force ones. I can see him now. He's got a fresh tattoo on his forearm. He's got another tattoo right on the side of his neck. I can see this dude, man. I mean, he's got money. He's got girls. I can see him. He's got a little light skin, honey on the left and he's got a little Latino honey on the right side. I mean this guy's life is like a living rap video. But this is the thing. The Bible says that he literally journeys into a far country. Now this thing I need you to get that this guy, he does not look on a map and say where's the far country? Let me find my destination uh, route on how to get there. See, understand, this guy's destination was not the far country. You see, that word journeyed in the Greek, that word doesn't mean to travel. It actually means to drift. In other words, like when he leaves his father's house, what he's planning to do, he's saying, I'm just going to set me up a little pad down in Murfreesboro and I'm going to hang out there. But then when he gets down to Murfreesboro, some of his little gypsy friends that engage in these kind of traveling uh, gypsy caravan parties that just travel as they go, he gets down in Murfreesboro and they're like, man, they got some show enough clubs down in Huntsville. And so they drift on down to Huntsville and they kind of hang out in Huntsville for a little while. And then they kind of get the word that there's some show enough dimes down in Birmingham. And so they drift on a little further down to Birmingham and you got to understand that he's spending money everywhere he goes. He's partying in Murfreesboro. He's getting down with it in Huntsville. He's getting down with it in Birmingham and then he finds out they got some good casinos down in Mobile and he's just a little further down to Mobile and then he finds out they got some floral girls that know how to drop it like it's hot over in Gulfport and so he drove on over to Gulfport and it's funny because now he gets all the way as far from home as he possibly can and it's funny because he doesn't just run out of money once he gets to the far country he's out of money by the time he gets there and it's crazy because the word of God says that literally that as soon as he hits bankrupt all of a sudden the famine comes and see the famine has a purpose to kind of show you how dependent you are upon the father at all times and see it's crazy because now all of a sudden I mean he got boys left and right I mean he just got folk on his job I mean he they just with him all the time so now he looked at his boy to his left and like yo yo can, can I can you break me off a little something he like man I got I hear my mama calling me he looks over when his boy and is like, yo, can, can, can you give me a little something? The homeboy's just like, dude, I, I'm good, man. I, I came here with you. I, I don't know how I'm going to get back home now. And it's funny because now all the girls that he's just been rolling with, I mean, he's just like, yo, can, can you help me get something to get back home? And now they don't, they don't even know his name. The girls that have been taken from him, they don't even know him. And I ain't saying they're a gold digger, but they ain't messing with no broke. Oh, y'all not with me in, the, in this room today. And, and it's funny because, because the word literally says that he falls upon such hard times there in the far country and the word of God says that no one gave him anything and the interesting thing is guess what he never planned to be in the far country but see the point I need you to understand is that sin takes you further than you want to go it costs you more than you want to spend and it keeps you longer than you want to stay but the good news is that at some point he came to himself He was the life of the party. Now he's the life of the pig pen. As he sits there in the filth of the pig pen, you can imagine the kinds of things for a while that were going through his mind. But the Bible says some interesting words. When he came to himself, how long did it take him? to come to himself. You know I said, dude, come on, let, let, let's keep it real. He said, what? He said, man, your, your girl's breath is on fire. And he said, man, what are you talking about? I said, I, I said you're serious. I, I said, have y'all ever kissed before? He said, of course we've kissed before. I said, have y'all had a close conversation before? He said, yes, of course we've had a close conversation before. I said, so you're telling me you have not smelled this woman's breath. He said, nah, man. 
He said, it's all good. He said, that's my baby. That's my boo. And it finally hit me. He had been in that breath so long. that he couldn't even smell it anymore. And, and, and I think the, 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 the hard lesson for each of us is this. I need y'all to follow me. We're going somewhere with this. You see, some of us look at the places that we are in our life as a phase, something that we will just grow out of. We think we'll just grow out of maybe sexting. We'll think we'll just grow out of licentious living. We think we'll grow out of that addiction. We think we'll grow out of being Pharisees. We think we'll grow out of self-righteousness. But there is something that I have learned, that the longer you are in your stuff, the more difficult it is to see how much you really stink. The longer that you are in that mess, the harder it is for you to recognize that there is something wrong with you. And some of us have been in our stuff so long that even when someone brings it to our attention, we justify it, we talk about it, because we've been in mess so long, we don't even think it's mess anymore. We've been in the relationship so long, we can't even tell that it's bad. We've been in the addiction so long, we can't even tell that it's addiction. We've been in sin so long, we can't even tell that it's sin. And so this young man sits in this pen, but the Bible says something very interesting. He came to himself. Now that's a problem based on what we just mentioned, because if you've been in something so long, how can you recognize that you actually are stinking? How can you recognize your situation? So how did the man come to this point? The phrase actually is a Semitic phrase, he came to himself, and it actually means this, he came or rather was brought to his senses. Okay, y'all missed that, let me say it again. It really shouldn't be he came to his senses, but that he was brought to his senses, or as the text says, he was brought to himself. In other words, there was something outside of him that brought him to where he was really supposed to be. Okay, y'all still not with me right now. In other words, what happened when he came to himself is this idea of something had to bring him to the point to remind him that who he was in the pen was not really who he was. It had to bring him to who he was, because who he was was his father's child. Who he was was somebody who had an inheritance. Who he was was somebody who had status. Who he was was somebody who had land. And the Spirit of God had to bring him to a place to show him that who you are is right now is not who you really are. I have to remind you of where you come from. And my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this right now, that the job of the Spirit of the living God is to remind us of who we really are. As a matter of fact, I'd like to suggest to you that we cheapen the power of the Spirit when we limit it to falling in church services and people shouting and screaming and speaking out loud. But the job of the Spirit, according to John, is to remind us the truth about who we really are. You see, we talk about the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth, and we talk about, oh, it'll lead you into the truth of the Sabbath. It'll lead you into the truth about the state of the dead. It'll lead you into the truth about some theology, but the Spirit wants to lead you into the truth of who you are in God. And what I want to say to somebody today is you can be better than who you are right now because that is not who you are. Who you are now is not who God knows you to be. Who you are right now, you can be better than that. And the Spirit has to constantly remind us of where we come from. When it brought him to himself. He says, I can be like my father's servants. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to head back to my father's house. Now, here's what's me. I don't know if y'all grew up this way. When I was in trouble, the last place I wanted to be was back home. I wanted to stay out as long as I could. I wanted to be away as far as I could. Now, as an only child, it was easy for me because when I got in trouble, there was nobody to tell on me. And so I appreciated this idea. I didn't want to be around my mother when I was in trouble because I knew when I got next to my mom, there was something that was going to happen. I knew when I came in contact with my father, there was something that was going to happen. But this young man actually in the midst of trouble is wanting to go home. Now, I remember this one pastor tells this story. He was climbing up inside of a tree with one of his friends and his father had told him over and over and over again, don't climb up that tree. 
don't climb up the tree. Stay away from the tree. Stay away from the tree. The young man, of course, decided, you know what, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And so he climbs up in the tree. And he got to this particular position in the tree where he had fallen on one of the branches. It looked like it was about to break. He had scraped himself up, had cut himself, and he was afraid to move lest the branch would fall and he would fall and maybe break a couple of bones. And his friend was sitting up there and he said, ooh. Oh, your daddy told you not to go up in that tree and you are up in that tree. I'm going to go and tell your daddy. And the young man said, please do. Please do. Boy looked at him. He said, you crazy, but I can't wait to see you get in trouble. And so he runs off and he goes to get his friend's father and his father comes out and he's getting ready to look at him. He says, I brought your daddy. He said, your daddy is here. Look at what your daddy's about to do. You about to get in trouble. And he's saying this right there with the father standing there. And the father looks up at his son stuck in that tree in an awkward position, a place where he never should have been in the first place, a place where his father told him not to go. And the father was in his suit and he took off his jacket rolled up his sleeves and began to climb up in the tree to get his son out of the tree. Because if it's one thing that the young man did not recognize who went to grab the father that the son recognized is that no matter how much trouble I am in, I'm still my father's child. And so no matter what mess I'm in, I want you to go get daddy because daddy is not here to scold me, but daddy is going to be here to save me. And young people, I want to let you know that we need to get to the point where we tell on ourselves. You ought not be afraid of letting your heavenly father know the mess that you're in because he's not coming to scold you. He's not coming to mess you up, but he's going to roll up his sleeves and get in whatever mess that you're in and pull you out. And I apologize on behalf of the Christian Seventh-day Adventist Church because we have made God this figure that we don't want to deal with when we're in our mess. We're afraid of him. We're afraid to, to admit, I'm up in the tree, daddy, and I've done something wrong because we've created this picture of God as this God who is coming to get us and not coming to save us. It's this works-oriented type of mentality that we pass down from generation to generation that we have to somehow be in a certain standing before God can come and take care of us. But while he was up in the tree... In the midst of his mess, the place he needed to get was with his father. And young people, I want to let you know that the time that you need to be closest to God is when you just finished sleeping with that person you had no finish sleeping with. The time where you need to feel the most comfortable calling upon him is that time when you have done the worst thing that you can never even barely forgive yourself for. Because I want to let you know that when you are at that moment, it's when God is at his best. And I apologize that we have presented this picture of God who was unapproachable until we get ourselves together. So the young man declares, I will go to my father's house. He can't even afford to get cleaned up but he decides to go home. And the Bible says some interesting words. So he got up and came to his father. And the Bible inserts this conjunction, but while. He was a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion for him. And the Bible says, and ran towards him. Now I will say two things and I want to pass this thing off. The first that is very interesting to me about this is the father notices him a long way off. And here is a concept about this idea of knowing him a long way off. There's two things. Number one, the father doesn't know why the son is returning. He could be returning to get more money because he's run out. He doesn't know if the son's heart is contrite. He doesn't know the why of his return. But the father is just simply happy that his son is coming back. 
And so the father is not concerned yet with the why or the how. The father is just glad that he's coming back home. I want to say something to you young people right now, but also to the adults, that some of us are away from God because you're trying to figure out your why you're trying to get next to him. I want to say this. If, before you understand your why, just get next to him. Before you come back to church, don't figure out if you're coming here for a girl, if you're coming here for music. I don't care. Just come home. I don't care why you are here. I just need you here because I believe that when you are here, God's going to do something while you're here. But some of us are pushing people away because we don't understand their why yet. Well, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you showing up? It doesn't matter. Just be thankful that I am here, that I am back home because I feel comfortable enough to come back to my father. And so the father doesn't care. He said, I, I do not know why this child is back, what he needs. I'm just glad he's back. Now, the Bible says this. The Bible says that he runs towards him. Now, the decor of an individual back during this time would have been a long robe. And the father, according to history, is an older man. It is actually extremely shameful for an older man to run because in order to run in a robe, you have to lift up your robe and expose your legs. And according to culture, you should not do that. But the father was like, cool, I'm going to shame myself just to get to the son. But there was something else that, that I found that stuck out to me about this. According to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 8 through 21, that when a son left and disrespected his father's house, upon his return, he was supposed to be stoned. Now, he wasn't supposed to be stoned by the father, but by those in the village. And so what the father recognizes, and he's very open in understanding of this law. And so what he does, as he's looking for him a far way off, and he sees the son coming, he recognizes that the law says he needs to be stoned. And that there are people in his community that are going to keep the law. And so, on the off chance that there were law keepers in his community, who were about to stone the young man on sight because he had broken the law, the father runs to the son, not just to embrace him, but just in case they start throwing stones. The stones will hit the father before they hit the son. Folk, I want to let you know something, that in our way in order to get home, the devil was throwing stones our way, but our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ran to a cross, got up on it so the stones and consequences of sin would hit him and not hit us because we have a God that doesn't care where we were he's just glad we're coming back home and he'll take your consequences he'll take your mess all he asks is for you to be brought to yourself and to come on home come on let's praise the Lord how many how, you know it's funny I want to I want to say this as we get to a place where we need to make some decisions about what we've heard, you know, that's like the most popular part of the story of the prodigal son. Everybody loves to hear the part of the boy who gets rescued by his father after he went out, the Bible says, with whores and with prostitutes and destroyed his life. Quick question, how many of you are thankful for that kind of God that you know you can come to no matter what you've done? Come on, say amen. Uh, I got to I got to I got to explain something to you real quick though. This parable did not really happen. It's a parable. It's a make-believe story that Jesus made up because of this question. Please don't miss this. I want you to understand the whole reason why there's a prodigal son story in the first place. The text that Pastor Snell read said, "And there were two sons." How many sons everybody? The parable starts off by him saying there were two sons, as if to tell us that the whole point of this story is not really about the kid who goes out, gets high, messes up his life, messes up with prostitutes and can come home. Jesus is really trying to explain something deeper to us about who he is other than just the son that messes up. And so here it is, essentially, the, the Pharisees are mad at Jesus because he associates with sinners. Did you hear what I just said? 
As a matter of fact, it is, it, Ellen White actually says that the parable of the prodigal son is being told at Matthew Levi's house. If you know Matthew Levi, he was the tax collector. Tax collectors didn't have a great reputation in those days. So essentially, Jesus had begun to build a reputation. How many can thank God for this? That he associated himself, himself with the worst people in society. And so while he's with this evil crowd, the Bible says the church folk, what folk everybody? Uh, you're going to come here right now. What folk everybody? The church folk come to him and say, uh, you hang with sinners and you eat with them? And Jesus' response is to tell this story. Pastor Kelly just ended us at the part that I want to segue to where the father receives the son. Now, how many like a good turn up or good kickback? Come on, say amen. How many know about a, a party? How many like parties? How many like great endings to stories? If this were a movie, most of us would like to end the story here, but the movie doesn't end here. The scripture says that when the son comes back home, that his father gets the fatted calf. Let me just break this down for all the vegetarians who don't know nothing about beef. In other words, the scripture is saying he gave him, I love this now, pray for me y'all, he gave him a grass-fed organic beef. This is the one that they had been preserving and preparing for the great celebration of the family. But instead of them celebrating what they had planned for, the father now changes the celebration and puts all the focus on the whore-loving, drug-addicted, nasty, stinking, perverted son who decides to come home. Here we go. And while this party is going on, the scripture actually says that the older son is in the field working. He's been working all day long. As a matter of fact, he's been working ever since his brother left and decided to do what he wanted to do. He was right there working. He was laboring. He was helping his father. And the scripture says that while he's working, he hears in the distance. Now, this is crazy. This must be like a serious party. Because the Bible says he hears music. I get that. I get that. I hear music. I, I get that. But the Bible says he hears dancing. Uh, I mean, they throwing down in there. I don't know if it's a clean pair of shoes with a designer belt. I don't know if somebody's watching themselves. I don't, I don't know what's going on in there. I don't know if they hitting the quan. I don't know if they dabbing. But the scripture says that the turn up in the house is so loud that the son can hear the party in the field. And now he mad. Now, I don't know why they asked me to preach this text, because this is like my story. Now, everybody can't, everybody can't relate to this. If you went out in the far country, they just gave you what you needed. Let me tell my story real quick. So because I'm the only biological child out of five, all four of my brothers and sisters were adopted. My first brother, he was adopted out of the... I mean, out of the worst circumstances in New Jersey, his father killed his three brothers and sisters by setting the projects where they lived on fire. He came to live with us. Then before him, my sister was adopted from Korea because in that culture, when she was born, uh, her father died. And because they operate on a good luck, bad luck system, her mother gave her up for adoption because they considered her to be bad luck. Then my two cousins, actual blood cousins, came to live with us after our family found out that they would be bounced around from foster care to foster care. That their father forced them to use drugs, forced them to use drugs in order to sell the drugs. And they were being molested and all kinds of things were happening to them. So when they came to us, they came with issues. Now, I'm the middle class kid who's been in Adventist schools his whole life, real talk, I really, the, the worst thing I did probably was lie a little bit, grab somebody's something here and there, 
But I didn't like, I, I didn't consider myself to be a bad guy out there. I was still in the church. I was in Pathfinders. I would preach on youth days, but I wasn't a bad guy. But when they came in all throughout our lives, my brother especially, he went out in the world and did his thing. Now, here's the crazy thing about it. He goes out in the world, does his thing, comes back in the church, becomes a lay pastor, and God blesses. And I'm mad. I'm like, what? I, I mean, if I would have played this right, I should have gone out there. All right, where are my real folk at? I stayed home, but I really was too afraid to go out there. And I mistaked compliance with obedience. I thought just because I wasn't at the club with my brothers, he, I was too afraid to do that stuff. I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm just gonna keep it 100. I was never that guy that went out there, but I would get mad with all these folk who would say, I went out into the world and I got hooked on drugs for 20 years. I had sex with all these women. And in my mind, I'm saying, really? And, and here's the good thing about those people. They go out in the world, they get to have sex, have a good time, party, a different woman every night, and then they're superstars when they come to church because now they got a testimony that people are more interested in rather than the kid who said, I stayed in church my whole life. Y'all not talking back to me in here. See, there's only a certain crowd of folk who understand what I'm talking about in here. You look at folk that went out and came back, and real talk, you feel some kind of way because in your heart of hearts, if you're honest, you wanted to go out there. You just didn't have the courage, and now you don't even have the testimony to go alongside it. And so the elder brother is really the central figure with the story. Jesus is trying to say, look, church people, understand something here that deceived people despise grace, but desperate people desire grace. Y'all not hearing me in here. The majority of us in here are not prodigals. We're not the boy that left. I mean, come on, nobody here is running a multi-million dollar drug business. If you are, uh, let's talk after church. We, we minister to you and we'll rededicate the money to the Lord's service. But for the most part, for the most part, we're like borderline. We're not bad, but we're not good. But we definitely, come on, y'all. We're not as bad as the crackhead out there. We're not as bad as the single parent mother out there. We're not as bad as the person who's gay out there. And what God is trying to teach us in this story, Seventh Day Adventist generation of young people and old people, is that what Christ celebrates is not the person that stayed Christ celebrates the person that left deal with that oh you didn't hear what I just said look at the Bible the Bible says that the party was thrown for the boy that love hookers and no celebration for the faithful no celebration for the one who was in the choir. No celebration for the one who participated in youth days. No celebration for the pathfinder. The party was thrown. The fatty calf was given for the kid that went out and messed up his life. And this is what self-righteous people have a problem with because they assume because they didn't go out like that, that they're really not that bad. And this is the only point that Jesus is trying to make. I got two lost boys. Two. One knows he's lost. The other does not. I'm done. This is what we want to clarify today. Like, I'm really concerned about like, what we're teaching our young people. Like, we're on this merit system. Let me, I mean, let me, okay, let me just say, like, I have two kids. Honestly, I want my kids to be like the older brother. I want them to keep all the rules. I want them to stay next to their father. I want them to be successful. You know, like the Adventist hierarchy. Like, go to Oakwood, get a real good job, six figures. 
come back to church and serve. Don't really make no waves. Just don't bother nobody. Don't create any problems. Just be lukewarm, middle class, upper middle class. And we kind of feel like that's the ticket into heaven. And what God is saying is, is I despise that. He said, I, oh Lord, y'all better hear. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. He says, I would much rather work with somebody that has fallen and hit rock bottom and knows it than to deal with a blind mindset of somebody who thinks just because I'm Adventist, just because my daddy's a preacher or my mom's a leader that I'm saved. I'm telling you now, the point of the story is that all y'all lost. All y'all need a savior. All of you are nasty. All of you are filthy. All of you are broken. All of you are wretched. All you like sheep have gone astray. We all need a savior. And so, like, last thing I want to say is, is you know, it's kind of crazy. It's like unfair, man. Dang. Like he goes hoeing. That's what the scripture says. It's funny because the brother is the one that mentions his lifestyle, which tells me he knew where he was, which tells me he knew where to go find him, which tells me because of his jealousy, because of his brother, he wouldn't go find him. Oh, this does not represent the culture in our churches. Let me ride this horse for a minute. We just got finished doing an evangelistic meeting and we baptized uh, several people in a particular area. And I had, and some of them left. Oh, can we talk honest here for a second? Some of them left. Does that happen? And so some of my members, elders, leaders said to me, Pastor, we don't need to focus on reaching lost people. We need to focus on fixing ourselves. I said, why do you say that? Because we can't keep the folk that God, that God is sending to us. I'm saying, like, well, what's, what's the problem with that? See, their issue is, is, oh, Lord, listen. They actually said there's too much emphasis being put on lost people. Now, many of you would not open your mouth and say that, but 99% of the churches in North America have embraced that mindset, which is why we're raising an elder brother generation of, of young Adventists who don't care nothing about lost people, who don't care about reaching lost people, and the minute they come, they see themselves as different. Can I help you with something? You're no different than the lesbian. You lust, they lesbian. They smoke, you slander. They get laid and you get low with your mouth. I, I'm just coming right down where Jesus is coming. Jesus is saying, look, I can't work with people who think they're better than they are. And in each one of the parables, I want the musicians to come, in each one of the parables, let me show you what happens. A party is called not for the folk that stayed, but for the folk that left. Now you might be saying, Pastor, that's the wrong message. Are we trying to encourage people to leave? No, we're trying to encourage people to see that some of them are here, but they really gone. You're, no, really, I mean like, this was my mindset. My mindset was, as I never smoked, I never drank. I didn't do any of that stuff. I'm better, I'm better. I'm a good person. And what God is reminding me today is, through this passage of scripture, Scripture says ain't nobody righteous. No, not one. And until you embrace the mindset that without him I could do nothing, then Christ can't do nothing with you. Anybody know anything about 12 steps? You've heard this. There's a critical point that you have to get to in your addiction recovery before you can make the journey towards wholeness. And they call it rock bottom. It's, it's essentially you getting to a place and saying, 
I'm not what I've been saying I was. In denial, like for real? Okay, you, you used to do it, you don't do it anymore, so you're there. God's saying, you never get to a place where you're there. The only way you get there is through the robe of righteousness that Mike Kelly just put on him. Heavenly Father, there are two kinds of people in this place right now that represent the two sons. There's the person who's been deceived by Satan to think that life is about independence from God. So they're running from God. Then there's the other person that loves recognition more than they love relationship. And the minute they see somebody else get grace, they get angry. What the boy should have done, the elder brother, is he should have gone into the party. But the scripture says he would not go in. In other words, there's some of us here right now, we, we love grace for ourselves, but we hate grace for other people. We actually feel like there's too much emphasis on grace. Somebody actually said to me, you got to balance grace and law. No, we don't. If you add any more law to your life, then you are lost. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. I don't need any more law. I need grace. Any real folk in here right now, I don't know where you are in your life, and you need to know that a God like that actually exists. That no matter what you've done, and this is why all three of these preachers standing here, we live to say this, no matter what you've done, you can never do anything to diminish God's love for you. It is unconditional. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. His love, the Bible says, is from everlasting to everlasting. David says, if I rise to heaven, God is there. He said, even in my worst moment, if I make my bed in hell, God is there. Romans 2, 4 says this. It says that it is the kindness of God, the grace of God that leads us to life change. If you want to change your life, you don't need a whooping. You need grace. If you want a different way of thinking, you don't need anybody to remind you of how jacked up you are. What you need is to know that God loves you in spite of that. Any desperate folk here today that need grace, desperate folk need grace, deceived folk despise it. Any desperate people right now that know that you need grace to overcome, grace to live right. If you're here, would you press to the front so we can pray with you this morning? We got to end this service. But when you talk about forgiveness and God's love and his compassion, how many feel like God should have given up on you a long time ago, but, 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 but you're thankful today that the Lord's mercy, his kindness, his goodness is from everlasting to everlasting? Any grateful people want more grace? Anybody want more grace? The scriptures teach us in Titus, the first chapter, that God's grace teaches us to live right. So I don't want anybody to be con confused here. Grace does not give license to sin. Grace encourages us to live right. Come on. How many, how many, how many parents here, you need, you need to start dealing in grace more than in law? How many pastors here need to start preaching more gospel and more of God's love and less of behavior modification? 
How many young people in here right now? You want to fall in love with a Jesus that actually looks beyond your faults and sees your needs. If you want to serve that kind of God, if you want to believe that he really exists and that he is a God of compassion and mercy, would you pull out of your seat and say, Lord, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Bless me now. I just want to know, is there somebody else that just wants to receive grace? You haven't been able to figure out how to take your life in a different direction. You're at a standstill. The Lord says, it is my kindness. It is my kindness that will lead you to life change. You need a picture of how good I am. You need to be introduced not to a God who looks to who looks to judge you every time you mess up, but you need to see a God that intercedes for you right now. You need to see a God that loves you in spite of yourself. You need to see a God that doesn't judge you based on what you've done, but believes in you based on where he's taking you. Anybody want to really fall in love with Jesus? I know you know what the doctrines are. I know you know what day is the Sabbath. But do you want to know that he is a lover of your soul? I invite you to come right now. Now there's, there's one more thing I got to say. and This is not going to be an easy one. It's not going to be an easy one. There's someone here right now that identifies with the anger of the older brother. This is not an easy one. We are taught that pride is one of the most difficult things to confess. And if you're not careful, your heart will become hardened because of a lack of forgiveness and because of grudge holding and, for, and feeling like you are deserving of more than what you're receiving. But you got to break that today. If there is such a person who struggled like the pastor for many years of being self-righteous, I want you to come right now. This is not easy. There's some folks that know you struggle with self-righteousness, with pride, with anger, feeling like you deserve more. But the Lord has revealed to you in this moment that you are just in need of God's grace as the person who leaves and goes out into the world. Somebody else, this is not, I'm telling you, this is not easy right here. But, but the people that make this move, the, the courageous ones that are willing to say, God, I've been, I, I've been believing that I've been much more deserving and, and better than I am. But, but in, the, in the presence of your love and in the presence of your kindness, I realize, Lord, that I am broken and I need you. Is there somebody else here right now? For real. If God, if God can break this, Drug addicts know they're drug addicts. Liars know they're liars. Prostitutes know they're prostitutes. Christians are confused. There's somebody here right now that needs to forgive somebody. There's somebody here right now that needs to, that needs to take a step in the direction of somebody, but anger and bitterness has held you hostage. And the scripture says this, if you don't forgive your brother, then your heavenly father will not forgive you. Is there somebody here today that needs to be set free from the hardness of your heart? Would you come right now? Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Holy Spirit, move right now. There's somebody who feels that you're being oppressed and suppressed to remain in your seat, but you standing is just an acknowledgement that without him you can do nothing and God is trying to humble you so that he can use you. Whatever you're holding on to, in the name of Jesus, let it go right now and be free. I'm counting down. We got to close this thing. Ten. God's calling you to come right now. Make a bold move. Ten. Nine. I need you to move right now. You, you, you can relate. I've been angry. I've been frustrated. I feel unappreciated. And you have placed yourself in a position where like the elder son would not even go in and celebrate his brother. You've got relationship issues with God and you've got relationship issues with people. And the Lord is saying, you are far from me, but you are in my house. You gotta come and 
just say, Lord, I need you. Eight, move right now. Seven. Six. We believe in God for revival in here. How can revival happen if people think that they don't need the Lord? 